Good morning, this is Distractor Beam, and today I'm going to be talking about Linux. This is a long video, so I'm going to be putting timestamps in the description below. I did a lot of research before I jumped into Linux, and pretty much every review of it said the same thing, which is if you play with Linux, you will learn things along the way, and it sucks for gaming. So what I did was a little bit different. I documented everything that I did from day one to becoming not necessarily good at Linux, but at least competent. And along the way, I could show you all the hassles that I had to go through to get there. So to start out with, I got a few distributions, and something everybody wants to know is which one should I get? Well, I tried six different ones. There is enough to get. Go to distrowatch.com and they will have links to all the different websites of all the top distributions. So I found all the torrents, downloaded them all, and then burned them all to DVDs. I felt it was important to see how the software acts on a bare system. I didn't want to have any virtual drive going on because I didn't want to have any drivers already enabled before the software is installed. I want to see how everything reacted as a bare install. So I cleared out an older 40 gigabyte solid state drive that I was going to use for Linux. I wanted to have Windows on one drive and I wanted to have Linux on the other drive. So I don't mess up the Windows drive. I, well, what you should do probably is unplug it. I didn't want to mess with my Windows boot, so I went into the BIOS and changed the boot priority to boot off of my Linux hard drive first. If I was going to mess up anything, it would mess up that hard drive and not my Windows drive. Before I start, I want to apologize because I do not have a pass-through recorder device. And even though I hate watching videos where people do this, I'm using a camera to record the monitor to show you what I'm doing while I'm installing the operating system. But that's the only option that I had, so sorry. And the first operating system I wanted to try was Ubuntu. At the time I downloaded Ubuntu, it was at 15.04, and I was having trouble getting it even started. If I put the disk in and turn the machine on, it would go through some booting, and then it would just go to a black screen. After doing this a couple times, I didn't realize that the logo that they had on the bottom was actually a keyboard that yields the interface. And to make that happen, you just hit the enter key. So once I hit the enter key, they've got a few options. And of course, I wanted to install Ubuntu. And if I choose that as the option, then it also just goes to a black screen. So I restart the computer again. And I hit the enter again, and I hit F6 for other options. At that point, I see a few that I really don't understand. So I try one of them, no APIC, and then try once again to install Ubuntu, and same thing, black screen. So I try to just mark every single one of them. I marked every single one of them, tried to install Ubuntu, and it, it went through, but it just gave me this weird screen with a prompt, and I couldn't really do anything because I didn't know what to do. So I decided I've had enough of Ubuntu for right now, let's try another one. The next one I tried was Debian, and Debian wasn't a problem. You only really need one DVD to install it, but I wanted to get all the other options just to see what they had on them. And I installed it, I put in every DVD, it installed perfectly. And it loaded up, and everything appeared to be okay. But the problem I found was that when I tried to increase the resolution to the 1920 by 1080 that I'm used to, and also to turn on my secondary monitor, it wasn't even an option. So I know what to do here, of course you need the drivers, right? I'm using an NVIDIA GTX 970, so I wanted to find the NVIDIA drivers. The first thing I did, of course, is I do what I always do when I'm looking for NVIDIA drivers. I go onto the internet, go to NVIDIA's website, and download the drivers. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. The first thing I learned about Linux is that EXEs don't work. .exe is, in fact, a Windows executable. It only works on a Windows environment. It wouldn't have mattered if it had worked anyway, just because these are designed for a Windows system. It wouldn't have worked on Linux. So I had had enough of Debian. I remembered seeing that Ubuntu was the most supported distribution, so I checked on the internet to see what they had to say. And one suggestion that I found on the internet was try no mod set as the F6 option. So I put the Ubuntu disk back in and try to load it up with the no mod set ticked, and it worked. Now from the very beginning with Ubuntu, I hated it. Just because if I open up a window, the close button is on the very top left. This screams Mac for me. And I'm very against Mac. I'm very biased against it. In actually a very irrational way. I should not be that angry at an operating system, but I am. So, I did not like Ubuntu. And on the left-hand side, that also showed what appeared to me to be the Macintosh dock. So I hated it. I hated Ubuntu from the very start. Also, I found that the resolution was not showing properly, and it was also not displaying my secondary monitor. So, I did a little more research and found out that in Ubuntu all you have to do is go to the device manager and there should already be an option to enable NVIDIA drivers. Because NVIDIA is considered proprietary software and it's not open source, Ubuntu disables it by default. But you can re-enable it if you choose to and you pretty much have to. After I enabled the NVIDIA drivers I got my secondary monitor to work and I got the resolution I was looking for. So I played around with the Ubuntu dock for a while and moved some things around, installed a few different things to see how it was and it worked okay. I started to actually kind of like the dock on the side 
mod because it felt a lot more like a taskbar. But as I played with it even more, I found out that when you really start loading it up with different icons, it becomes a real hassle to work with, especially if you have it on a secondary monitor with a lesser resolution. What will happen is there will be so many icons, and as you scroll through them, you'll easily pass by the one that you're looking for. So you have to go up and down and up and down and up and down just to get to the one that you want. It seemed strange to me that the mouse wheel didn't work on this. The only way to get this thing to move is to actually take the mouse pointer and then put it to the top or the bottom and then it will scroll. At first I hated it, then I liked it, then I hated it again. I decided I didn't like Ubuntu, I wanted to try the next one, and the next one I wanted to try was Linux Mint. This is one that I see a lot of people using. It looks a lot like Windows and it feels a lot like Windows, or at least it seems to feel a lot like Windows. The first problem I had with Linux Mint was just installing the damn thing. Now fortunately it bypassed the whole would you like to install and it just opened up the live CD version of itself. So you put the disk into the computer, the computer turns on and then it loads the entire operating system off of the disk. From there you can install the system. Now, the problem I had here was that I had never heard of a swap drive before and this is something that Linux Mint requires you to make and what that is is virtual memory if you're on a Windows machine. We'll say you have four gigabytes of RAM on your computer and what you're doing requires more than that it will actually write to the hard drive and use that as a temporary memory. For Linux for some reason you actually have to partition the one drive you have into two partitions. Now, because I had never heard of this before I didn't know how much you're supposed to use and seeing as how I was using a 40 gigabyte drive to start with I didn't have a lot of room to play with and what especially didn't make sense was the fact that I have 16 gigabytes of RAM on my machine anyway I shouldn't need virtual memory or a swap drive so the fact that Linux Mint requires you to make a swap drive actually really agitated me now if you ask the professionals the amount your swap drive should be should be approximately twice that of your RAM now I didn't really know that and the first one I saw said it should be about one gigabyte and that worked out fine beyond that it installs very similarly to Ubuntu and with Linux Mint again you have to assign the Nvidia drivers at this point in my process I played around with Linux Mint for a few weeks and then I decided I was going to try a few other operating systems with Kubuntu I decided I was going to try the guided install instead of doing it manually with guided you can still assign which hard drive you wanted to install it on unfortunately if you use the guided install you're not given the choice of how you install the bootloader it just automatically puts it on your first drive and for me that was my Windows drive so now I have the bootloader on my Windows drive which is exactly what I do not want so if you're going to install the bootloader on the secondary drive make sure that you use the manual install and of course install the NVIDIA proprietary drivers another thing that really bothered me with Kubuntu is after I got all the drivers and everything installed it seemed to recognize my monitor incorrectly it made all the text really 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 small and everything I did seemed to make it even smaller and smaller the first thing I tried to do to fix this was I tried to change the resolution and that just made it worse so of course the first thing I did was change the resolution back the second thing I tried was changing the font size and I changed the font size it changed the fonts for some windows but not for others I did some research online and I found out that when you go into the font size there's an option for force max dpi 96 so you just check that hit ok and everything was pretty much all right after that and a lot of people seem to have some problems with the oxygen font which is the default from kubuntu so you might want to try that if you experience this problem beyond that kubuntu seemed to work ok the next distribution I wanted to try was Kali. The way I learned about Kali was by watching a YouTube video where a guy performed magic on his loud neighbor and he used Kali to do it. This is in fact a distribution that's designed specifically for hackers, for penetration testers. So if you want to get in some really advanced things, this is what Linux to some people is all about. Kali is pre-built with all the software required for doing things like getting into people's internet, breaking into their computer, doing lots of things so to get you a lot of years in jail. None of that really mattered to me, but I did want to see what it looked like, so I installed this one. While I was installing it, I couldn't help but feel that it felt a lot like the Debian install. And I can also say that after I got it installed, that this was the very first operating system that I got installed that worked right out of the box. Both monitors were working right away. I had the max resolution right away. This is the only operating system that gave me what I wanted. And as I was looking at it, I couldn't help but feel that it appeared a lot like GNOME. So if you're comfortable with the GNOME environment, you'll probably be happy with Kali. And you can see at the top left that there's a lot of options for different cracking software, none of which I knew how to use. Now, technically, you could install this software and use it just for watching movies and browsing the Internet. It would work perfectly fine for that. It is way overkill for the average user. But if you want to learn how to do a lot of advanced things, Kali's the way to go. The final operating system that I wanted to install and the one that I was hoping was going to be my final operating system was Ubuntu GNOME. What this is to me was just Ubuntu but with the close button at the top right. So it appeared to feel more comfortable. And the install went smoothly. It installed exactly like Ubuntu. And Ubuntu GNOME of course once again you had to set the proprietary drivers. 
the next thing that I wanted to do was to get a screen recorder, something that I could use to capture what I'm doing on the screen without using camera to film the monitor. Everybody always says the number one is open broadcaster, so I try to get that one. Now something I found was that I could not get the damn thing installed. If I go to their website and I put in everything that they need, you need to get FFMPEG, update it, then get open broadcaster and update that, and it should be there, but it wasn't. It was just throwing a lot of text around and I had no idea what it meant. So, try the next one. Next one I tried was Istanbul. Istanbul worked great. The very first time I tried it, which was for about three seconds. After that, I tried it again. I tried it for a longer duration, and it crashed. And every time I tried it after that, it crashed again. So Istanbul did not work. The next one I tried was XVID Cap, and it worked. The only problem I had was it did not record sound at all. And I mean no sound. The second problem with XVID Cap was that every time it recorded, it would overwrite the previous file. So in order to use this, you had to record something, then stop, then rename that file, move it somewhere, record again. So XVID Cap wasn't going to work. So the next one I tried was Record My Desktop. Record My Desktop worked, and it recorded sound. Although I couldn't really tell at the time because when I tried to play it back, I couldn't hear any of the sound that I was recording. It turned out that it actually was recording the sound, but for some reason on this Linux distribution that I was using, uh, it did not have the codecs required to play the sound that it was recording. The second problem that I had with Record My Desktop was that when you finished and you hit stop, it would then encode the video. And if it was a long video, it would take a long time, which meant that if you stop after a long recording and you wanted to record again immediately, you would just have to wait. And that drove me nuts. Especially considering I was so used to using Shadow Play on my Windows machine. I use Shadow Play all the time. I'm using Shadow Play right now, as a matter of fact. Shadow Play is great because no matter what I'm doing, if I see something and I want to record it, I just hit Alt F9 and boom, it's recording. And I just wasn't getting that out of these Linux programs. Another thing that I was having a problem with with Record My Desktop is for some reason, every time I would click the record button, my taskbar would go away on Linux Mint. So I'd just be playing along, I'd hit record, and then the taskbar is gone, which means that I no longer had access to the programs that were running. And that's a big problem. That just wasn't going to work for me. I was getting some really bizarre functionality out of Record My Desktop on Ubuntu GNOME. It would try and record not just my primary screen, but my off screen as well, and it was recording every single window. I don't know if Ubuntu actually does that, where it just puts the windows behind your desktop, but it didn't give me something that I could use that I could actually record and then put that in a program and play around with it. This was unusable content. So none of these programs were working and I decided, you know what, I'm going to try and give Open Broadcaster another chance. Now I took a closer look at the code and I found out that the and and in the code is actually just means do the first function and then do the second function. This time, instead of copying the entire line as they gave it to me, I just copied the segments and it installed. I got Open Broadcaster working now and after playing around with the settings, I found out that it is actually a pretty handy little tool. Still not as good as Shadow Play, but pretty damn good. More importantly, it doesn't overwrite files, it records I sound, and it records everything in a yeah, format it. that is what usable. Is the next thing I was really interested in was, can I find something that I can use to record videos that I find on the internet? Now, almost anybody can do this. You can find stuff. It's real easy. It's, it's all out there. You find something on YouTube, you like it, you can download it. Boom, you got it. But I'm talking about things like live streams. I want to be able to record even live streams. I've got a program that can do it on Windows, but I want to see if there was something I could use on Linux. And I I want to record not just one stream but multiple streams all going on at the same time with sound so a simple screen capture isn't going to work i want to be able to record all the data that's coming from the stream now i took a look around and i found out that there are actually ways to do it but it's far more advanced than anything i'm going to be capable of in the very near future but i did find one program called live streamer and live streamer is designed to take the stream as it's coming from the internet and then plays it in your media player you don't have all that chat going on on the side you don't have all the advertisements it's a lot cleaner interface with that i was able to play Play it in VLC player. VLC player has a recorder built in so anything that's playing on VLC you can record. So I was able to find something I can use to record live streams. When VLC player records a live stream it records it in a .ts format. All that means is transport stream and you can freely rename that to .mpeg and that will play in most media players. And that's actually a really good find for me because the program I was using to download before I was paying $60 a year for. With Livestreamer I can do the exact same functionality and the only reason I know about it now is because I tried Linux. So plus one Linux. One of the problems I had with Kubuntu was that I could not make shortcuts, even with Steam. 
Normally you can just right click on one of the games and click on create desktop shortcut and you'll have a desktop shortcut. But for some reason in Kubuntu it did not allow that. Another problem with Kubuntu was for some reason every time you single click on a file it would open it. So I had to go into the settings and change that. That was a little weird. In Ubuntu GNOME if you try and create a desktop shortcut it doesn't really work either. In order to do that you have to type in this weird line of text in order to make that happen. Ubuntu GNOME just wants you to go to the activities button and then search for everything. But I just like having it on my desktop so it's kind of a pain in the ass to make that happen. Something that was really bothering me between distributions, and especially for getting support for the distributions, was the wording is a little bit different, the coding is a little bit different. So for example, this one, it said sudo yum install gnome tweak tool. Well, that wouldn't actually work for me. I would have to understand what it's actually trying to say, sudo apt get install gnome tweak tool, but for a novice, this isn't going to be an easy barrier to pass. The next problem I ran into, I like watching movies in my secondary monitor and then playing on my primary monitor. So I'll often open up like a YouTube channel or Twitch or something like that on my secondary monitor and just maximize that screen while I play on the primary monitor. The problem I was having was that after I maximized that and I went back to the primary monitor, it would minimize the full screen video. Now this is actually a problem with Java that Windows apparently takes care of by itself, but Linux seems to have a problem dealing with it. I find that you can actually modify Java with a hex editor using this tutorial, but a beginner isn't going to have any idea what to do here and they're probably going to end up screwing up their computer trying to make this happen. Something else I like to do to organize my desktop, sometimes I'll open up several web browsers and I will try and move tabs into each one so I can scroll through them while watching one. But I find that for some reason on Linux this can be kind of tricky. The tabs don't always show exactly where they're at and the windows can appear not really where they are, so you really have to watch the mouse when you do this. Also for web browsing there's a feature I use a lot called auto scrolling. And in Windows, this is just enabled by default. You middle click the mouse button down and then you can scroll all the way to the bottom or all the way to the top of the page very quickly. For some reason, this is disabled on Linux, or at least not enabled. On Firefox, it's easy to fix. You just go to Settings, Advanced, and then use Auto Scrolling. Check that and then you're good to go. But for Google Chrome, you actually have to get an add-on to make this work. If your distribution comes with Ice Weasel, then you can still install Firefox. But if it comes with Firefox and you try to install Ice Weasel, it will just assume that it's Firefox. So Ice Weasel and Firefox are basically the same browser. The next thing I wanted to know about was voice over IP software. So there was a lot of different guilds or groups that wanted to use different voice over IP programs. So uh, the ones I got used to were TeamSpeak, Ventrilo, Mumble, and Skype. I've also heard of people using Raycall, and I understand that Raycall is an option in Linux, but I didn't test it because I've never, ever, ever used it. TeamSpeak was the first one that I tried and it was also the most complicated one to install. It required you to jump through some extra hoops that were not necessary, type in some extra crap that did not make any sense, but after you did, then it did work. Mumble is easy, I found it right in the software center and it worked right out of the box. And Skype was also in the software repository. Ventrilo wasn't really an option, but Linux has another version called Mangler, which does exactly the same thing. So if you're supposed to get on a Ventrilo server, you can use Mangler. With that, I was fairly happy just on the account that if I needed to get on any of these servers that people were hosting, then that is an option on Linux. It's not a problem. All right, now for the fun part, gaming. This is a long topic, so the too long didn't read is these are the games I tried, and these are the games that work. Everybody knows Steam is the option for gaming on Linux. On Ubuntu GNOME it installed easily. I just went in sudo apt get install Steam. But for some reason after I installed it, it gave me a failure. And I tried several times in several different ways and I looked on the internet and I was not able to find a solution for this problem. All of the solutions I found for it were for Windows based systems. Go into the Steam, Steam apps, etc, etc, delete this and that. But it just didn't work. So after doing that, I of course removed Steam and then reinstalled it and tried it again. I went online to Steam and got the Steam launcher and I used that to install Steam and got the exact same result. At this point, because I'd always heard that different distributions work better with different programs, I decided, you know what, maybe it's time to try a different distribution. So I installed Kali. After I got Kali up and running, I installed Steam and got the exact same fatal error on a formatted, reinstalled operating system. So I uninstalled Kali, I formatted the drive, and then I went to bed. The next day I had done a little bit of research. I found out it's entirely possible that it could try to connect to the wrong IP. And so you should go into the host file, disable that IP, and then it might connect. So the next distribution I was going to install was Kubuntu. So I installed Kubuntu and I just did a simple sudo apt-get install Steam. It installed and it also updated. So I'm not sure if it was the Kali or the Ubuntu or just that the DNS started connecting properly. I'm guessing that it was actually the DNS and the IP address, but I don't know for sure. Out of all my testing, this is one of the big unknowns that I got. But anyway, 
anyway, I got Steam running, and if you're not sure which games that you have that will work on Linux, just go to Library and then go to Steam plus Linux. Now, for me, the hundred and some odd games that I had, about 40 of them were listed for Linux. Any original Valve game is going to work, so the Source Engine games are all going to work, but just to make sure I want to test one that was not a Source Engine, so I decided to sync them too. This is one of the few games that I've got, and I'm still playing. I wanted to make sure that this game, if nothing else, worked on Linux. I installed it, and it worked flawlessly. I did notice that my aiming was a little bit off. The mouse is a bit more sensitive on Linux than it is on Windows, and I think that has something to do with mouse acceleration. Now, there's a tutorial for disabling mouse acceleration on Linux, so I'm going to be doing that and then be testing it, but just something to be aware of. Graphically and frame rates, it seems to be exactly the same as playing on Windows. All the players that are playing on a Windows machine are playing with the Linux machines. None of that matters. So, new games work. I want to see about old games. Now, the old game I wanted to play was one of my favorite games back in the day. It still is actually a really good game, Team Fortress Classic. I felt it was important to try multiplayer games just to make sure that everything connects well, and everything worked perfectly fine. I had some of the funnest time just playing this game on Linux. So Steam works, Team Fortress Classic works. I wanted to try Play on Linux, which is the front end for Wine. So I got Wine, and I also got Play on Linux. The first game I wanted to try on Play on Linux was EVE Online. This is one of the other few games that I still play these days. And so I just went through their options, and I hit OK, and, and Yes, and that kind of thing. But something that was starting to scare me was that I'm using Linux on a 40 gigabyte drive, and I have a large one terabyte drive that I use for programs only. Windows, I have a similar setup, and it all works fine. So I have Windows installed on a 250 gigabyte solid state drive, and then all of my other programs and games I put on the programs disk. So for Linux, I was going to need to do something similar. For EVE Online, I just wanted to try it and see if it works, but I only have 14 gigabytes. Everything seemed fairly straightforward. I just hit next, 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 and it was waiting and waiting and waiting, and at the end of it, it said, Wine seems to have crashed. So I decided I was going to try and put it on the external hard drive. Maybe it didn't have enough space. In Windows, you might have heard of something called a junction. And a junction is like a shortcut, except that it can also trick a program into thinking that that is the folder it's supposed to be in. So you can put the program on another drive, and then where the program thinks that it's supposed to be going to, you can create a shortcut to that location, and it will read it as if it's on the same drive. And the Linux version of this, or at least so I thought, was called Symlink. And it turns out Symlink and junctions are actually a little bit different. Symbolic links can link to other computers as well. So symbolic links are a little bit better. So I had some confusion on how symbolic links work, but I ended up making it work. For Kubuntu, it was actually really easy. It was just a matter of right-clicking somewhere, hit Create New, and then Symbolic Link. So plus one Kubuntu on that. For other operating systems, you have to type in a line of crap. So I make the symbolic link, and I have some trial and error on which way the symbolic link is supposed to go. I should have probably known, but I made it work. At first, when I was using symbolic link, I linked the Play on Linux virtual drives, because that's what I saw in my home folder. But it turns out that what I was actually supposed to link was the dot play on Linux folder. The dot play on Linux folder is a hidden folder, that's what the dot means, so I had to find the hidden folders. Also in Kubuntu, this was real easy, it was just a matter of hitting view, hidden files and folders, and then boom, I could see it. In Ubuntu, it was just a matter of hitting control H. So I find the dot play on Linux folder, I copy that to the other drive, make a symbolic link to it, and then try to reinstall EVE Online. Two things that were weird happened when I installed EVE Online. Number one, it patched really quickly. So it got me to a running state too fast, in my opinion. I'm thinking that it didn't download everything and was going to download everything else in the background, but it took a long time to load. When I watched the intro screen, it was really blocky. And the entire time I was playing it, which was just for a couple minutes, it said loading resources in the bottom left. So I'm thinking that while I was playing it, it was still downloading. I honestly haven't installed this game in a very long time. I've just had it there. So EVE Online works. Now, I haven't really done any further testing on it. The next game I wanted to install was a game called World of Warcraft. This is a game that I feel is extremely important to be able to make work on Linux because so many people still play it. Really, it comes to simple games like this that a lot of people play, that if you can't play this on Linux, then they're never going to swap to Linux. So I thought that was very important for me to make this one work. And I did the basic thing where I go to the World of Warcraft website, I download the installer. In Play on Linux, it has an option to install from that installer, and I did that. Play on Linux is a little bit deceiving because after it installs, it says install is done. Then if you click on that button, it closes the installer. You just have to understand what it's doing. When it says install is done, don't click on that. Matter of fact, hide that if you can. So the World of Warcraft launcher is installed, and this is where I found the next problem. So I put in my email, I put in my password, and I hit login, and then it gives me an error. I didn't even read it the first time. I figured, okay, maybe I typed in my password wrong. The actual problem I was having here was you need to select a region. So I click on the select region button, and nothing happens. I tried doing several different things, like hitting tab, hitting the mouse wheel, control, shift, space bar, whatever I could do to make this thing change. None of it worked at all. So I figured, Okay, I did something wrong. So I hit the can't log in button, and of course it gives me a, a basic, would you like to reset your password? No, I don't need to reset my password. So I go to the play on Linux, and I click on the next button, 
And it starts downloading a few other things. So I was like, okay, maybe I screwed up. So it downloads some fonts, it downloads some DLLs, and then it tells me it does not see the wow.exe. It needs to have the executable on there so that it can have something to point to to play the game. And of course, for World of Warcraft, that's wow.exe. The problem is when World of Warcraft installs, it installs the launcher, then the launcher installs wow.exe. So Play on Linux thinks that there's a problem and it refuses to run. And the launcher, I can't get past the login screen. Okay, so I'm thinking maybe I really screwed up somewhere and I reinstall the game and I get the same problem binary not found wow.exe so play on Linux gave up and surrendered so what's the next thing to do I'm gonna try and load the launcher from the file system so I find it I hit the launcher and it gives me the exact same screen that I had before please log in so this is when I think maybe I have a corrupt installer if it buttons aren't working then the installer might be broken so go back to battle.net re-download the launcher and try it again exact same result I search around in the forums can't find any answers I say okay well you know what I play this game on Windows, I already have the game installed, I've got the wow.exe. I'm going to make a symbolic link to that folder where I've got the game already downloaded, already installed. Double click on the wow.exe and then all of a sudden, boom, it's playing. Okay, so I've got it. Wow, excellent, awesome, it's working. I put in my email, I put in my password, I hit login and everything says incompatible. Why does it say incompatible? Now at first glance I thought the reason it said incompatible was because I was playing on Linux, but actually the only reason it's saying that is because the game is not patched, so I have to be able to run the launcher to patch the game to play the game. So same logic as before, I've heard that people say different programs work better on different distributions. Maybe it's time to try another distribution. So goodbye Kubuntu. This is where I want to try the most supported version of Linux that there is, which is Ubuntu 14.04. That's an older version of Ubuntu. I was previously trying 15.04, which is a newer version. It's not a support. It's going to be more buggy. It's kind of like the beta version of Ubuntu. But for Ubuntu 14.04, I put the disk in, I go to install it, and I get the black screen. Okay, I know what to do. I go to no mod set, and then I try to install it again. Same thing, black screen. Basically, Ubuntu 14.04 will not work on my system. I think it has something to do with the NVIDIA GTX 970 that I'm using, but I don't know why. So, go back to Ubuntu 15.04. But before I did that, I wanted to go on to Ubuntu and see if they have a new version. And they do. It's 15.10. I download that, put that on a disk, install that. And this time, I don't even have to put in the Nomad set. So they fix something between 15.04 and 15.10. That makes it work. So first thing, I get Wine. And I decide, you know what, I'm going to bypass Play on Linux because it doesn't seem to know what to do. And I'm just going to try and click on the World of Warcraft setup.exe using just Wine. I get all the same stuff and I get the select your region, does not work. For some reason, while I'm using Open Broadcaster now, it decided just to record the top left of the screen and I don't know why. But you should be able to see what's going on anyway. So I get battle.net, and then I go down to put in my name, and all of a sudden it switches to Europe. And I'm clicking and I'm clicking and I'm clicking, and I want to get it to say America's, just not doing it, I don't know why. So I just say, heck with it, I'll try Europe and just log in. And it gives me an error, but then it gives me the install location. It's like, okay, great, so I'm going to change the install, and then it gives me an error. But this is where the next problem comes in, which is that World of Warcraft is 28 gigabytes, and I don't have that many gigabytes left, so I have to make a symbolic link. Ubuntu does not work like Kubuntu. I can't just right-click and create a symbolic link. I have to type in a line of crap. So I just decided at this point, you know what, I'm going to try and see if the installer will work at all. So I double-click on it and it gives me another error. So I try it again, and it gives me another error. And I don't even get to click on anything. As soon as I launch the launcher, it just fails and crashes. So I figured because I didn't install with Play on Linux, I didn't get all of the proper Windows dependencies like the DLLs, so I decided I'm going to try Play on Linux again. This time, Play on Linux on Ubuntu. So I go through the Play on Linux installer for World of Warcraft, and everything looks the same as it did in Kubuntu. I'm clicking on the buttons. The buttons aren't working. And at this point, I just start mashing my keyboard. I hit absolutely every single button I can. I'm hitting tab, tilde, escape, F1 through F12, every single possible thing. Until I see out of the corner of my eye on my secondary monitor, it has a list of regions. So I go over and I click on Americas. And what I found was that the tab key was working. It's just that I couldn't see it because it was hidden on my secondary monitor. Instead of putting it right next to this application, it stretches it across. And I really don't know why. So that's good. That's a step in the right direction. So now I have to choose an installation path. And this is where my next problem came up. Linux doesn't use letters for the drives. It just calls it whatever you call it. So for me, I have my program's disk on Windows is labeled E. On Linux, it's just labeled program. But when you use a Windows installer to look at a Linux disk, it just gives it its own letters, it seems. One way you can find out which drive it is, is just to click on it and then see what loads inside it. You can base what's in there as to which drive it is. But 
for some reason for this, it didn't always work. So I would load up one and I can see, okay, this is the one that's got my media. So this is my media drive. But these letters do not correspond at all to the Windows letters. And for some reason, whichever drive is my program's drive on here, there were about six options that it could have been and they were all blank. I decide I'm just going to finish the Play on Linux installer and as soon as I do, it gives me the error of course, wow.exe not found because the launcher is not created yet. Because I want to get a thorough test on this, I want to make a symbolic link to this on a hard drive that has enough capacity to hold all of World of Warcraft. So I copy my wine prefix folder over to my programs drive and make a symbolic link to it, which was a little bit tricky. But after a little bit of trial and error, I was able to figure it out. So I now have my wine prefix folder on the programs drive. I have a symbolic link from the original directory to the new directory. I run the launcher and it crashes. Okay, so I'm going to try again. I know that I have a Windows installed version of World of Warcraft and I know that it's not patched, so I go back to Windows. I patch World of Warcraft, then I go back to Linux and I make a symbolic link to the fully installed version of World of Warcraft. Then I run the wild.exe, it loads, great. I hit connecting, it loads, great. I can see a character, everything's running fine. I go back to my realm list, I can see some of the characters that I've used, and then I try to load the game, and it crashes. So I try again, and just I'm clicking on another character, the game crashes. So I try again, and this time I'm going to try and disable all of the add-ons. I'm thinking maybe they're interfering with the base version of World of Warcraft. So I disable all the add-ons, and it crashes. I do a little research on the internet, I find the uh, disabled peer-to-peer -peer connections in the downloader. So I open the battle.net launcher and I'm going to try and get the peer-to-peer -peer off. And I load it and as soon as it starts loading it crashes. I do more research and I find that I might be missing some DLLs. So I go and I download all of these DLLs that they recommend. And I place them all into the Windows System 32 DLL locations. Only one of them was not already there. So with a new DLL I run the launcher and it crashes. And I had another idea where I was going to, instead of symbolic linking to the wine prefix folder, I was just going to symbolic link to the entire World of Warcraft folder. So I'd have all of the original Windows DLLs, and I would have the full World of Warcraft installed from the Windows installation. So I have the Play on Linux dependencies installation, and within that I have the full World of Warcraft installation. So I have absolutely everything I possibly could have to make this game work. And then I run the wild.exe. The first thing I do is disable all of the add-ons and it crashes. Alright, so this time I'm just going to do the easiest I can. I'm going to load up the game and then click play on the very first character that I can and it crashes. Try disabling the add-ons again and it crashes again and so now I'm really fed up. So World of Warcraft, sorry, can't get it to work. This time I'm going to try some more Steam stuff. With Steam it's easy to change folders. You go to view settings, then download Steam library folders, add library to folder and select where you want your programs to be installed. Now finding your hard drives in this selector is a real pain in the ass the first time if you don't know where to go but it's under media then your username and then you'll find all the drives. And of course I want to put all my programs in the programs drive. After you make the new folder, if you already have installations, you can just copy those installations into the new folder and they will work automatically when Steam starts up. And with Ubuntu, if you just right click and create a desktop shortcut, it makes it right away. So I was installing a newer source game, which is Counter-Strike Global Offensive. This is a game I don't really play anymore because I got sick of people camping and spending 12 minutes watching two campers fight. But I do miss it a little bit, so I decided I'd play it, but I was going to play it with bots because those, those rounds go faster. And this game works flawlessly. There's absolutely no problem with it whatsoever. And this is where things are going to get a little bit more tricky with Play on Linux. I wanted to find out if I could play an old game that I have called Imperium Galactica 2. I've got the CD, but the CD has a few scratches on it, so I made an ISO of it. So I wanted to find out, could I install a game using an ISO using Play on Linux? So I browsed to the Imperium Galactica 2 and ISO, and gave me a bunch of errors, and then it crashed. So I said, what the hell, I'll just put it in the disk and see if I can make that work. And ta-da, it works. And the install starts. The install goes all the way through, just as it would on Windows, and then it gives me an option to create an icon. It puts a shortcut on the desktop for me, that's great. And when I run the launcher, it gives me an error. So I find out that you can mount an ISO onto the file system just by right-clicking on the ISO and then clicking uh, Archive Mounter. And I try to install the game again. And of course, you have to install some dependencies, I understand, so I click on the 32-bit libraries and I start looking at the different ones and I have absolutely no idea what they are. So I start clicking on them just to see what's going to happen. I see different ones, which are obviously for DirectX and different Windows-based applications, Adobe Air, etc. But there's things like D3DX10, 
10 D3 DX11, so that sounds to me like DirectX 10, DirectX 11. Obviously, I'm not going to need that for an old game like Imperium Galactica 2. I don't know what all this stuff is. So I just get a bunch of them and hit next, and then boom, immediate crash. So there you go. That was the wrong choice. So I go to install it again, and I'm going to try to use dependencies again, but I'm just going to put on a few things that look like they make sense. DirectX 9. And I'm just going to try and install just that with this game and see if that works. It extracts and installs the DirectX 9. I browse to my newly mounted ISO, and it crashes. It does not like the ISO. So I go to install it again. And this is one thing that where Play on Linux is really starting to bother me. Every time something fails, I have to start all the way over, and I have to overwrite everything I did. So all the dependencies that I downloaded and installed, I have to download and install them again. There is no option for holding on to the original dependencies. You just have to overwrite everything and, and just overwrite the entire virtual drive every time you do this, and that really bothers me. But the game installs, and I double-click on it, and it crashes. I look through the, the error details, and nothing makes sense. So Imperium Galactica 2, not going to work. So I'm going to try another one. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. This is one of my favorite old one-player games. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 is available on Steam for Linux, but the first one was not, so I'm going to use Play on Linux for that. So it installs the dependencies, ask for the CDs, click Next, etc. And it's installed. Done. Boom. And as soon as I click on it, it crashes. The configuration is crashed. All right. No problem. I don't really need the configuration. Let's try the actual game. Click on the game, and it crashes. MD5, some mismatch, one attempt. I got two icons on the desktop. I guess I'll just try those. Same thing. So KOTOR is not going to work. So I decided I'm going to take a look at Wine Headquarters. They have a list of games that they can get to work and games that they can't get to work. And it seems like a lot of the games I've been trying that I can't get to work, a lot of other people have been able to get to work. I'm guessing I'm doing something wrong, but I have no idea what it is. So I was thinking about StarCraft, and of course StarCraft also uses Battle.net, so if I can't get Battle.net to work, I'll never be able to get StarCraft to work, so I'll just skip that one. So let's try League of Legends. It's not designed to work with Linux, it's not supported on Linux, but let's try it anyway. And there was one guy that got League of Legends to work, and he made a little tutorial, so I followed that. Wine CFG, and set it to Windows 7. Now looking through Wine CFG, I don't see anywhere in here to set to Windows 7. So that's not going to happen. Instead of doing that, I'm just going to double click on League of Legends and try it. And something kind of weird happens. I keep on hitting next and then half the buttons disappear off the bottom and it crashes. So I can't even get through the installer. So I try it again and I change the install directory a little bit and I get the exact same problem. When it says ready to install and I'm supposed to hit next, the game just crashes. So I'm done with League of Legends. Next game was a game that I really, really enjoyed called Mass Effect 2. So I got the game out and I put the disc in the drive and I used the Play on Linux installer. It gets its dependencies and then it says please install Steam. Now there's a problem here. I have Mass Effect on disc. I do not have the Steam version of Mass Effect 2. So even if I install Steam, it's not going to be able to install Mass Effect 2. Unless I buy Mass Effect 2 again on Steam, and I'm not going to do that. So Play on Linux completely fails at installing Mass Effect 2. Another game I was thinking of trying was Star Siege. It's an old Mech Warrior style game that I really love. And it's not playing Linux, and I wasn't going to screw around with the dependencies anymore, so Star Siege wasn't going to happen. Alright, let's try Skyrim. One thing that I was really interested in testing was whether or not I could use mods on Skyrim. Now, unlike Mass Effect 2, there's the Steam Store version, or there's the DVD ROM version. Of course, I've got the DVDs of this, I don't have the Steam version, so DVDs. And I hit Next, and please install Steam. Now, mind you, this is the Windows version of Steam. I already have Steam installed for Linux, but this is the Windows version, so this is the second version of Steam. Now, I personally have a real problem with this, and that is that I don't trust programs that install other programs that require you to log in. That's how key logging works. Now, I don't think that Play on Linux is going to try and steal my codes, but this is a real red flag for me. So I close out of Steam and I hit Next, and it actually installs a few other things, and then it gives me another error, which is that my kernel is not set correctly. So I have to set my proc xys kernel yama ptrace scope to zero. So I went to the link that they had, and it says that some distros, including Ubuntu, use an extra paranoid kernel security. Well, I like paranoid kernel securities. I understand that you have to turn some of them off to do certain things, but when it comes to the kernel, that's real, real, real low security, and I don't want to mess with that. Now, I understand that if I want to play this game, that's just something I'm going to have to do, but I'm going to skip that for now. So let's try another game, Civilization IV. An oldie, a goodie. It's probably the last good Civilization game that came out. And it got stuck on a screen says, please wait while the virtual drive is being created for a long time. So I hit cancel, and I tried the install again. 
And I got to the installer and it started installing. Great. And as soon as I started to play it, it gave me the error. Civilization 4 crashed. Click debug link for more details. At this point I'm starting to think that maybe it has something to do with the symbolic link, so I copy the folders back over to the original drive and try it again, and it doesn't work. The symbolic link has nothing to do with it, it just doesn't want to play Civilization 4. So let's try a real old game, the very first game I got with our first real family computer called Age of Empires. First one. It's on the Play on Linux list, and I put the CD in. For some reason though, it does not see my CD. The computer doesn't see the CD. I don't know if that's the CD or if that's Linux or what, but it does not see my Age of Empires disc. XCOM Enemy Unknown has finished installing, so let's try that. I click on it and it loads. Alright, great. And everything looks good. I'm going through the menus, everything looks good. And as I'm playing the game, this is where it starts getting a little bit weird. Now I can move all the characters around and everything is fine, the frame rate is great, but when I try and scroll around the map, it feels like I'm pushing a brick wall. And then when I stop moving, it does all the move all at once. The game works and it's technically playable, but I would never be able to play this game for a length of time like this. That scrolling is driving me nuts. So this is the first Linux game installed through Steam that does not work 100%. It seems like every developer these days has their own launcher. So for Battlefield games, there's Origin. Does Origin work on Linux? Everybody says no. There's no Origin for Linux. So we know Steam works. Does Uplay work on Linux? Uplay does not work on Linux. That means that all the uh, Anno games, those aren't going to work. And I've got some old games that I got on a GameStop app a long time ago. It was actually called Impulse at the time, and it was for Sins of a Solar Empire. And if you got Sins of a Solar Empire before a certain date, then that's the only way you can play it. But Impulse then became called GameStop app, and GameStop app also does not work on Linux. If you would purchase Sins of a Solar Empire at a later date, all of the codes that you got for that would also work on Steam. Unfortunately, I got it too long ago, so in order for me to play it on Steam, I would have to rebuy the game on Steam, and I'm not going to be doing that. So, Origin, Uplay, and GameStop app, if you have any games on there, throw them away. Next thing I wanted to know, benchmarking. What can I use for benchmarking? I found a few programs, one called System Profiler and Benchmark, which I couldn't quite understand how to use. Then I found Pharonix Test Suite, which just kind of gave me some information. I, I like when it's running a benchmark for it to like show me things happening, squiggly lines or something. And this, it just gave me a number. This is what you got. I didn't see it do anything at all. So then I found another one called Globs. This is the only one that really gave me what I was kind of looking for, which it ran a test and then it told me what the FPS was as a result of running that test and I got 60.4 on all of them. I don't know if that's max. The tests were fairly simple. It wasn't really what I would call a, a thorough test. So the next thing I wanted to see was what can I use to play my music. I don't really listen to music that much but uh, at some point I might and I want to know that I can. The software that came with Ubuntu, which comes with a lot of distributions of Linux, is Rhythmbox. First thing I tried to do was just drag a song into it to see if it would play, and it did not. So then I want to just go find a song to play on it. I looked to change the preferences, and as soon as I did that, it wanted to open every single song that I've got on that hard drive. And that drives me crazy. So many music players do this. You just point it to a path, and it finds every single song that's in there. So I closed out, and I opened it back up, and it had a few of the songs in there, so I just played one of them, and it worked and that's that's really all that matters does it play the music yes other programs people are using audacious clementine so i decided hey i'll try audacious everybody talks about audacious i'll give that one a shot and i'll install clementine while i'm here one thing that i immediately liked about audacious is if i open up a file and i play it it just plays. Now, plus one Audacious. One thing that I really hated about Audacious, though, was that the background is a blinding white. So I wanted to find themes. How can I make it so that it doesn't blind me every time I open up? And there's no options for that. There's probably a way that you can download a theme and put it on it. For something like this, if it just doesn't work after I install it, then it's not good enough. So let's try Clementine. Clementine and the Ubuntu Software Center is the number one rated music player. Immediately what I like about Clementine is that you can change the theme and you can make it so that it is not a blinding white. And of course this one just creates a music library just like Rhythmbox, so I didn't really like that, but it seems to do it fairly quickly. And then I've got everything. And it works. And one thing that I found was kind of cool was that the scrubber on the bottom will show some kind of pattern showing the intensity of the song. And another thing that I found that I really like was that it has this little button called Extras. Rain made something that I've been looking for for a while. I've actually downloaded sounds of rain. I work night shift and it's really hard for me to fall asleep sometimes and rain just knocks me out. I don't know why. So this is amazing for me. And then it also said make it so, so I clicked on that one too. And it's actually the sound of the Starship Enterprise. It's this background hum. 
Um, which is amazing. So Clementine, that's not a plus one. That's like a plus 10. Great job. There's two things that I need an audio player to have that not every audio player has. The first is I needed to be able to change the output device. If you watched my video about how to stream music through Mumble, this is why. And the second thing is the only music I really listen to anymore is from Frisky Radio. So I need to find out if I can broadcast the music from Frisky Radio to Clementine. And Clementine does both. I need a program that's good for re-encoding videos and on Windows, hands down, the best one is Handbrake. And I looked in the software center and it's available for Linux. Handbrake it is. I checked it just to make sure it worked and yes, it does work, no problem. However, I found that the video was a bit fuzzy. And that's when I discovered that this entire time while I was recording this video, I was doing it in 1280 by 720. So I was recording this entire thing in smaller resolution. Sorry, everybody. But that's something to keep in mind. If you're going to install Open Broadcaster for the very first time, make sure that you check the settings on it and make sure that it said 1920 by 1080. And I need something that I can use to burn DVDs or CDs. And of course, the top one is Brazera Disk Burner. I don't really need anything and fancy it works you can burn a movie that you can put into a dvd player or music or isos whatever it is you want it appears to work just fine then i want something that i can pull movies off of dvds so if i've got a home movie and it's burned and i want to be able to get that onto the computer here is dvd rip it does the job very simple I wanted something that I could use for torrents. Transmission is generally known as the BitTorrent client for Linux machines. And just to test it out, I re-downloaded Ubuntu and it downloaded perfectly fine. It downloaded a 3.9 megabytes per second, which is just as fast as uTorrent. The next thing I wanted to know about was antivirus. Now, a lot of people will say, Linux, you don't need antivirus. They don't make viruses for Linux. Well, that's arguable, but I personally want to have antivirus on my system. I want to have something there that's going to be keeping an eye on what's going on. I did a little research and there's not really many options. There's a few for anti-malware, but not really for antivirus. One of the top options was Avast, which I'm personally not a fan of. Kaspersky is an option, but it costs money and I wasn't going to be doing that. What a lot of people seem to be using is an option called Clam AV. So I downloaded Clam AV and it's a terminal use, so I downloaded Clam TK, which is the interface, and I couldn't get it just to scan. Now either it was scanning and I didn't notice it, or this is something that really bothers me about all Linux applications, is that they really lack progress bars. You know, anything, even just a percentage saying what percent it's at. There's so many programs that Linux uses where they just fail to put in any kind of a reporting of where it's at, where it's going, how long it's going to take. And that bothers me because I don't know if the program locked up or if it's just taking a long time. Now, if I have a progress bar, I can wait. I'm cool with that. But if it's just got a little wheel that's spinning or even nothing, which is worse, which is what Clam TK has, I don't know if it's doing anything. I don't know if it's done. I don't know if it did anything. I didn't see any kind of reports. So Clam AV and Clam TK, in my opinion, are not an option. So I feel if I'm running Linux, I'm open. And that's kind of a foolish feeling to have just on account of Linux is supposed to be so secure, but that's a philosophical choice, and I, I don't believe it. So I'm running without antivirus. I'm probably going to be installing a vast if I decide to use Linux more in the future, but uh, I'm not really happy with that. For somebody like me where I'm testing software a lot and trying different things and opening myself up to doing stupid stuff, I really need antivirus. I need something that's going to be watching my back. I need a program that I can use for doing quick trimming, and I've used Avidimux for that on Windows. It works great and that's also in the software center for Linux, so Avidimux, that's a win. The next thing I really needed was video editing software. For this, my go-to is Sony Vegas. That's been what I've been learning for the last however long I've been doing this, and it's always done everything I need to do. Sony Vegas does not work on Linux. Neither does Adobe Premiere, and neither does Final Cut Pro. So if you're used to using any of these premium software, just get used to not using it. There's a program called Lightworks that seems to be the premium editing software for Linux, and that's great except for the maximum resolution you can render at is 720p. Now, if you watched my video on how to cheat at YouTube, then you would know that 4K is the only resolution that I'm willing to render at. The other option for Lightworks is if you buy the license, and that's really the only difference between the free one and the purchase one, is that the purchase license will render at 4K, and that costs $25 a month, or $440 to buy the thing outright. Now, that's okay, and I can understand that, except that the reason I'm going to Linux is for a little bit of freedom and for a cheaper price. And that means for the software I'm going to be getting, I don't want to pay that kind of money for it. Two of the more popular versions are Caden Live, and open shot open shot it's unstable for me i put three movies in it and started editing them around and it crashed it just crashed right away if i can put three movies in it and start moving them and it crashes it will never work for the amount of editing that i do 
The next program I wanted to try was Caden Live. Caden Live has a lot of support. If you go on YouTube and you check out anything, then there's going to be somebody that'll answer your question. So that's great. The only problem I had was after putting a bunch of files in and then trying to render it, I got a text file back. When you usually render something, you're supposed to get a movie back. But I got a text file. And I don't know why. I even went on YouTube and I said how to render on Caden Live. And everything that they did was exactly like what I was doing. It's just giving me a text file. And it would be the name of the video .mp4, but if you tried to open it, it wouldn't play. And I couldn't figure that out. Now, when it comes to something like this, I'm obviously going to be running into problems when I'm using a movie editor. There's going to be things that I don't understand that I'm going to have to do some research to figure out. When it comes to something as simple as rendering a video, if that just doesn't work out of the box, then this program is borked. It's just not going to work for me. The absolute worst thing that could happen is I put 60 hours of editing time into a video and then try to render it, and then it just gives me a text file. These are the kinds of problems that I want to find out before I start putting that much effort into a video and not have to find out afterwards. So what does Open Shot and Caden Life have in common? They are blind, stinking bright. When I say bright, I mean really bright. Like if you had to actually look at this for a period of a couple hours, your eyes would be burning. Let's take an example from Adobe Premiere, Sony Vegas, and Final Cut Pro. What do they all have in common? They're dark gray. Why is that a good thing? Because it's not going to burn your eyes if you have to look at it. Now I understand you have to take breaks when you're doing video editing. And if you're going to be doing 60 hours of video editing, you're obviously going to be taking a lot of breaks. If you're in the zone and things are working for you and you're really into it, if you have to stop because your eyes are burning because the screen is too bright, then that's a problem with the program. And yes, I could use a red tint like Flux or something like that to apply to my screen a nice darker image that would be less damaging to my eyes. But if you're doing video editing, you want to make sure that the video looks exactly like you want it to look as a final product. So using that really isn't an option. And with that, we can talk about Blender. Now, anybody that does video editing on Linux, chances are they've at least tried Blender. Blender is designed as a 3D renderer, but they've also added sequential video editing to it. The first thing I wanted to know how to do was how can I do a picture in picture. So I took part of the video of me playing XCOM and I chopped it into four sections and it's actually not really as hard to do as it is even on Sony Vegas. On Sony Vegas doing this is a complete pain in the rear but for Blender it's real easy. So I chopped it up, I rendered it and just a real short clip, two second video, it took four minutes to render. Now honestly that's not a heck of a long time for that kind of a video. And after looking at it and just playing with it for a little bit I realized that this is so damn complex that I'm going to have to do a lot of research research to figure out how to do it. And after having a good grasp of that in my mind, this is what happened afterwards. Alright, look at the screen very carefully, because this is me deciding whether or not I want to use Blender as my main renderer. I could go back to Sony Vegas and make it easy on myself, or I could learn this whole new thing which could completely crash and fail and, and just give me trouble the entire time. And with the, the luck I've been having trying to make games work, I'm extremely skeptical. I could put in hours and hours and hours of time making this thing work and it could crash at four minutes in. I'm really scared right now, but I'm going to try Blender. <sighs> blender. Okay, take a look at this. This is me dragging a file in. Now, if I was to put this next one next to it, it puts it on top because it wants to put it next to this line. So I have to move the line and then move both files in front of this. So every time I put in a new file, I have to move the line. And then drop the file. And you would think that I'll be able to just grab a bunch of them. But it doesn't work. It only does the one that you selected. So I have to do this one at a time. And this is a long process, especially considering all the files I've already put on here. And another thing that's annoying is that this endpoint here is 300,000 frames. 
Now you can try and click to move this here to put a file in front of it. But it doesn't work, it just messes up. It will only put files at the end of this line, which means that if I get beyond here, then what I end up having to do is I'll put it oh, that's not helpful. Yeah, this is the type of thing that I've been dealing with. Here you can do shift S to get them both lined up. And then you can move them where you want it to be. But if it goes beyond the frame and you can't see where it's at, unfortunately it doesn't follow it. So you just have to drop it. And then do it again. So working with a ton of files is not really awesome in Blender. The 300,000 limit cannot be changed. Now this is kind of a bummer because on Sony Vegas you can of course move it as far as you want into infinity. But this is a problem with this one. Now you can see here that this green bar and the blue bar line up pretty well. That's the video and the audio. But if you see here it does not line up. And the reason is because the frame rate That was a mistake. Yep, now I broke it. All the audio shrunk to nothing. What the hell's going on? Okay. Thank God for Control Z. But this one's this video is at 30 frames per second, so that matches the project. And this video is at 24 frames per second. Well, it's probably less than that. It's probably at about 15 frames per second. So it does not match the project. Now the audio plays at one second you know, per second. It doesn't matter. It just plays in, in time. Whereas the video just plays in frames. So if there's 15 frames, it puts 15 frames down. 15 frames is one second. So if it's a two second clip and it played at 15 frames per second, then it just shrinks it down to fill 30 frames per second. Which means that in order for me to work with this, not only is importing all these files going to take a really long time, and not only do I have to stack them on top of each other, but I'm also going to have to change the velocity of all of these video clips to match the project. And that is a matter of... I don't even remember. That's not right. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do that again. I forgot how. I'm going to have to do that for every single video that's not in sync with the audio. And that's just to get it to play at the correct speed. Even if I didn't want to use the audio, that's just to get it to play in the right period of seconds. I'm not sure if I want to do that. But it's going to be a good experience, I guess. So once I get done with this, I'm going to be changing velocities like crazy. Something that occurred to me that bothered me now. If the end is at 300,000 frames and your video plays at 30 frames per second. And there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. That means that your video maximum length is 2.7 hours. Now I'm probably not going to be making a video over 2.7 hours, but even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be able to. If I'm playing at 30 frames per second, I would either have to drop the frame rate, but even still, having a finite point where you just can't make it any further really bothers me. Alright, it seems to have done something now where it gave up on rendering everything else I have. So this one I just put in, and you can see it, and everything else is gone. So that's nice. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done with it. 
Okay, so let's look at the next program. This is one that I didn't even know about until I saw in Tech Syndicate. There was a post about the top video editing, and this guy recommended this program called Shotcut. There's really no support for it. Whatever support there is, is from the maker of Shotcut themselves. But after playing with it for a little while, I saw this is easily the best video editing software that is out there for Linux. Aside from possibly Lightworks, which I haven't tested. Now this is definitely not for advanced users because it is missing some things that somebody like me from Sony Vegas is used to, like masking and deform, that kind of thing. But it does have a ton of options. It has its own stabilization, it has its own text entry. It really has a lot of things. And if I was just going to do some basic editing to a program, this is per somewhere between beginner and moderate level video editors. And it works. It, it does the job. The only problem I had with it is that it does not seem to work very well with Open Broadcaster. If you're trying to record what you're doing while you're using this, I don't know why. Maybe they're using the same resources, but but they do not jive together so you have to do either one or the other now I was able to get recording and it did work but one or the other program would freeze from time to time or crash and so that's not cool now shotcut is kind of cool in that it works a little bit like that old program virtual dub and that it just gives you a folder with a bunch of files in it and one of them you just double click it and it runs it so shotcut opens directly from that folder you do not have to install it it makes me worry a little bit about its resiliency like if you have too much going on will it crash but after I shot down to open and broadcaster I did not have any problems and I think if I was going to do any video editing in Linux I would be using this Microsoft uses Microsoft Office Linux uses LibreOffice and Libre is French for freedom so what is LibreOffice well if you use Microsoft Word then you're going to use LibreOffice Writer it can open Microsoft dot doc documents so if somebody sent you a file that they used in Microsoft Word you can open it up with LibreOffice Writer the only thing I really care about for Microsoft Word is spelling correction so I just typed in some things that I knew were wrong and see if it was capable of fixing it and it didn't so LibreOffice Writer good enough for me. It also has one that's just like PowerPoint and I don't use PowerPoint so I could give two rats but there it is and the other one that was LibreOffice Calc which is just like Microsoft Excel. It's just a spreadsheet product and I just open it up put in a few formulas that I know to see if it works and it works exactly like I expect it to so plus one for LibreOffice. Okay, so this is time for my analysis, and what I really want to attack here is, I can say that Linux works great for basic users, and I mean very basic users, which is probably most of the Windows population anyway. And what I'm meaning there is, can it play videos? Can you browse the internet? Simple things like that, it works perfectly for that. If you just want to check your banking, if you want to do that kind of thing, it's done. It's already there. Now beyond that, middle average users like me, doing things like playing games and that kind of thing, it's not that Linux itself isn't there, it's that it doesn't have the support. So looking at, for example, this post about one big problem with Linux and for other developers too is the problem of targeting a specific version of the platform. Yes, I understand that perfectly. So what that means is that if you're running OpenSUSE or if you're running Ubuntu or if you're running Debian, they're not going to be able to support every single distribution that's out there. And for many reasons. I mean, for example, I personally worked as technical support for a major camera company. And when they bring in new guys to have to train them, they have to make sure that they're able to understand both Windows and Macintosh. Most of the people like me that only knew Windows, we had to first learn Mac. Macintosh before we were able to learn how to support a customer that's calling in when they're using a Macintosh computer. Now if you were to add Linux to that list and say everybody that came in and they knew Windows, they also had to learn Macintosh and they had to learn Linux, you would have to spend more on training them. They would also have to understand how to support somebody on Windows XP, Windows 98 Second Edition, Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, Macintosh OS X, OS 9, OS 8, Linux. You can just look on DistroWatch and see all of the top 100 distributions of Linux. And things are going to be a little bit different for every single version. Like for Windows, if I had to fix a driver problem, I had to be able to know how to get to the device manager for every single operating system of Windows. But just getting to the drivers for a few of these, for the six of them that I used, it's, it was just jumping through hoops. So instead of training somebody for four weeks on how to understand the different operating systems and then how to solve different problems on them and then to actually understand the cameras themselves if you're to include Linux in that it would easily quadruple that amount of time when it comes to a game like World of Warcraft most of the problems are gonna be like I lost my gold or someone hacked my thing or I, I chose the wrong button but every once in a while there's gonna be a real problem where like I can't install this game please help me and if somebody's calling up with a less supported distribution well, I'm gonna go to the bottom here Univention I don't even know if that's a thing they're gonna have to have somebody that understands Univention and every single person there 
player really needs to understand Univention. So that's not really an option. What that means is, just what this person said, if you can get the thing working on mine, then you don't need us to support you. We can still just support Windows. It's a lot cheaper for them to only support Windows and Mac. Now, if you ever, ever, ever want to see them supporting Linux, then you have to make sure that we just standardize it. And what I mean by that is maybe push for developers to support only Ubuntu. Now, I would say Ubuntu because Ubuntu is the most supported distribution on the internet. And I know that because of all the times where I had to search for something, I said, how do you fix this on Linux? The answer was for Ubuntu. Make it work on Ubuntu, and then if you can make World of Warcraft work on Ubuntu, people can easily make it work on OpenSUSE or Univent. Well, maybe, I don't even know what that is. But support one of them. Support one of them, and then if you can get that far, then you can get more of the population on Linux so that they can start working in that way. One thing that I was finding with all the different distributions that was giving me a problem is that I really missed the taskbar. And I even went online and I found, like, what are solutions, what are things I can do to get a taskbar, and I found things like Tint2, which worked, and it gave me a taskbar, but it did weird things like it would open up a tab and it would open up another tab in my secondary monitor. And there's probably reasons for that, but it wasn't modifiable, and that was my problem with it. I wanted to be able to choose either one side or the other, and I I found that there was actually options for that, but they didn't work. I would choose it and it didn't do anything. And the other thing I found, especially after working with Windows 8, is that I really like having stacking programs. So if I open up 16 instances of Firefox, each one of them is going to be stacked on top of the other. So I can just highlight it and then choose the instance that I want. Whereas with most of the taskbars that I found on Linux, if I open up 16 instances, it's going to give me 16 different tabs on the bottom. And that got to be a bit overwhelming. When I opened up too many, they were starting to run into other things and giving me other problems. Now as far as a taskbar goes, the best one I found that's like a taskbar was on Linux Mint. And Linux Mint really is an easy one. It was probably the only reason that I kept on using Linux in the first place is because it felt the most like Windows. So Linux Mint is a great one for that. The one I ended up finishing on, which was Ubuntu, the one that I hated the most from the very beginning, ended up being great because everything that I was looking for in the taskbar ended up being in that launcher. Now there's a few things that I didn't like about it. For example, one thing that I put on there was Amazon. For different philosophical reasons, I I don't want to have any advertising built into my desktop. Also, it seemed to have a problem with so I'm going to be filling that thing up. As I scroll around, I really need to have the middle mouse wheel able to control it because if I have to scroll up and down every time I go to it, that's kind of a problem. And I don't like it taking over desktop space. I was able to solve that by making it auto-hide, but that auto-hide feature ended up sometimes getting in the way and being a problem and not even accessing necessarily every time I wanted it to. So I'm really iffy about how much I like that. But even with all that being said, after coming back to Windows, I felt uncomfortable on Windows, and that was a really weird feeling to have. So Ubuntu, after you use it for long enough, it does actually become very comfortable. Now all in all, I like learning, so Linux is going to be great for me because there's going to be a lot for me to learn, and all these problems that I am having, I'm probably going to find a way around them. I'm probably going to figure out how to make Play on Linux work better. I'm probably going to be able to figure out how to make all these games that I tried work, but it's going to take a lot of effort on my part. So that's my analysis, and thanks for watching.